Real New Yorker is someone who knows their history, who looks other people in the eye on the street, who talks to the person next to them in the elevator, who tells their life story to the person next to them on the bus, who knows everyone on their block, who knows all the storekeepers by name. You know, that's like a New Yorker. It's like you take the, the globalness of the city and you make it very intimate by actually recognizing and acknowledging people. That's the way. The Lower East Side was a place for people who nobody wanted, who came here, who lived under very bad conditions and created labor movement, who you know, changed American politics. There was a lot of support for women's suffrage in this neighborhood, housing, organizing, so much that happened here. But you know, it was when I moved here, people thought I was crazy. You know, it was considered a dangerous neighborhood, whatever. You know, and I used to get robbed all the time and everything. That doesn't happen now. It's way overly policed around here. You can't do anything without the police coming around. And this building, we went through a lot here. We had a four-year rent strike in the building. We had a kid who was born in the building. His mother was a drug addict, and the city came and took the kid away. And some people in the building went down to social services and got him back. And he still lives here, even though his mother died. And there's a whole bunch of us who've lived here forever. My next door neighbor was born in the building. And then you have the dot comers who've lived here too, and they pay six times as much as we do, and they complain about noise, and they act like they're from the suburbs, and they make demands on you that are crazy, and they don't understand the culture of the building. Like next door to me is an old dyke. She's a Stonewall original, Italian woman. And she and her lover yell and scream at each other. You know, they scream, I'm going to kill you, you fucking asshole, and all that stuff. It's been like that for 20 years. So this little yuppie moved into the other apartment, and one day she knocks on my door, and she's like, I'm really worried. Should I call the police? I'm like, don't call the police. You know, they don't understand. They don't understand what it is to live together because they, lived in, they grew up in those individual houses. So it's a very weird culture clash in here, very strange. I remember when I first read that article in the Times about gay cancer, I thought that it was going to prove that homosexuality was biological, and that that's why everybody was going to get gay cancer. Because that year, the, the, the Red Cross would not take blood from lesbians. So there was an assumption that there was something inherently genetically, biologically wrong with being homosexual, and that's why people were getting AIDS. And that fit into what I had always been told about me, that I was wrong and bad. So there was that identification. Later, when of course I realized that that wasn't going to happen, that's later. You're in that moment, and all of a sudden you're one and the same. And there was John Byrne, who was a guy that I knew really well. He had been in a show that Robin and I did, and his lover was Tim Miller. And he had some kind of, um, they thought it was something, too many white blood cells or something. And then it was called GRID. And he did a performance at PS122 about what was wrong with him. We didn't know what he had. That was my first exposure to it. So then Jonathan died, and I remember hearing that the nurses would not bring food into his room, but his mother kissed his face when it was covered with sores. And then it just became clear that these guys were dying because they were gay. And I had been treated so badly by my family for being gay, so badly. And I had suffered so much. And it's like, I knew that that's why this was happening to them. I can't ex really explain it more clearly than that, but it's like this wall kind of melted and suddenly they needed help and we needed it. We needed to confront this thing because it was a thing that had hurt us so much and now they were dying from it. It was the same thing. It was the abandonment of gay people by their families or however you want to look at it. That's what it was. The real devastation period of AIDS is late 80s, early 90s. And that's when people were dying constantly and being in ACT UP mean, meant constantly being around dying people. I mean, that was just your reality. I mean, I guess I was 32 years old. And that had been my reality for almost a decade, for a decade at that point, being surrounded by dead people. And I wrote about it as it was happening. Um, I was a first, one of the first AIDS reporters for The Voice. I was an AIDS reporter for The Native. This is very early on. And uh, a lot of the people who were also documenting from very early on died. So after a certain point, the amount of people who had been writing about it from the beginning, who were still alive, was like a handful. And so I became, what by, by default, 
I became one of the chroniclers of the AIDS crisis simply because I managed to always stay alive because I wasn't an at-risk person. And I ended up writing four books about the AIDS crisis, and I did a bunch of plays, and I wrote many articles and a couple of nonfiction books about it, and I, I've had a very long, long view of the whole thing. I've experienced it all the way through, simply because I lived.